The following short lecture is to give people an idea about how immunohistochemistry works, especially if you are maybe joining a lab that uses this technique or are trying to figure out a little bit more about it beyond maybe what you've heard about in a class. In this slide set, I inserted a bunch of dra drawings and shapes, and a lot of them are from uh, the biorender.com site where you can kind of put together your own things with their uh, shape stuff. So I recommend you give it a look if you can. All right. So uh, immunohistochemistry is all about trying to stain a particular target. Immunohistochemistry you can break down based on its name into three parts. We've got immuno having to do with the immune system or in the specific case, antibodies. We've got histo having to do with tissue as in biological tissue, like parts of organs and things like that. And then we have chemistry being just chemicals interacting with each other. So immunohistochemistry is used to stain very specific targets using antibodies. We are in luck because antibodies that are made in various animals and including ourselves can target extremely specific protein sequences. So what this can mean is that you can create antibodies against any protein that exists effectively. So uh, one example might be if we're trying to find where a certain thing is in brain tissue. So let's say it's the dopamine receptor. And so on a given neuron de designated by this sort of oval shape here, there may be dopamine receptors. And so let's say that we want to target something like dopamine receptors in red here. Now, the thing is that we have to actually get the antibody from some source. And this is something that companies will in a way manufacture or at least purify in order to sell to various laboratories. And so the way that they make antibodies against this target is by basically immunizing animals so that they create antibodies against the target. Our immune system, as well as animal immune systems, they don't like foreign proteins. So if there is something in the blood and the immune system sees it and says that does not belong there, it will create antibodies to flag the target for destruction. We can use this property to harness the antibodies, to extract them and purify them. So let's take a look at how exactly this works. In order to get the antibodies, a company will have to have these cells and the cells may need to be purified. So if it's brain tissue, they may need to extract uh, brain tissue. There are more modern methods where they can get just cells to express a ton of dopamine receptors. However they work it, they'll have cells that have dopamine receptors. They'll then take either the whole receptor or fragments of the receptor protein and purify them and isolate them from all the rest of the cellular stuff. So that all they have are either the whole dopamine receptors or just even fragment of dopamine receptors, the same fragment all across the board. Next, they will take this purified protein concoction. They will put it into a syringe, let's say, so that they can inject the syringe into the blood of a farm animal, such as a goat. And so this is just an injection that gets the immune system noticing that, oh, something foreign has been introduced. The goat is not harmed in this procedure, and we're just basically uh, inoculating it with a small amount of protein so that it produces antibodies against said protein. All right, so then how do we get it out of the goat? Well, the goat will start producing the antibodies against this foreign target, and we can extract some of the blood, certainly not all of it, just some of it. And then after purifying out the immune fraction of the blood, and then the antibodies out of the blood, they can get their goat antibody. Now, this antibody is uh, having to be probably purified for targets like dopamine receptors. So they can't just take all the antibodies out. They also have to skim through the antibodies to see which ones react to dopamine receptors and discard the rest that do not. So this is kind of a painstaking process that we won't really get into the details of here. Okay.
So then we can actually perform immunohistochemistry. So let's say we have a section of brain tissue and that brain tissue has many neurons and many cells in it. Some of those have dopamine receptors. And so with these sections immersed in solution, that solution can contain our goat made antibodies. And so these antibodies will float through the solution and hunt down dopamine receptors and stick to them. And this is all well and good. The problem is that unlabeled antibodies can't really be seen, certainly not to the naked eye. And even with a lot of different types of microscopes, we wouldn't be able to see them. They're kind of semi-invisible uh, and also certainly microscopic. So we wouldn't really know where the dopamine receptors are on a slice of brain tissue or other organs or really anything. So we need to do something that will get the antibody to show up and thus by proxy, the target. One way that this is done, though this is much rarer nowadays, is that the manufacturer that produces the antibodies and sells them can apply a label to the antibody. This label can be something as simple as fluorescent uh, tags, so that they're kind of like glow in the dark stuff where you put them under a certain light under a microscope, and then they will beam back a different color of light. So in the case of glow in the dark stuff, you might be familiar with how black lights uh, will cause fluorescent stuff to beam back a green color. And a common fluorescent protein works in a somewhat similar way, maybe with slightly different colors. But the problem is that this is not a very powerful method. If you only have, let's say, one goat antibody, tagging to one dopamine receptor at a time, and it has like one or two fluorescent tags on it, it may be difficult to have a strong signal, especially if the antibodies might get, have a tendency to get snagged on other parts of the tissue and get lost. So that could amp up the background uh, labeling in the rest of the tissue. And you can't really see where the dopamine receptors are. This can be called a bad signal to noise ratio where the noise is the background fluorescent stuff or the background labeling that just kind of happens when antibodies get stuck on anything. And then the signal being, oh, the antibody is specifically binding to their target. So a bad signal to noise ratio might look something like this. This is a picture of fluorescence where we have green labeling. And the thing is that we don't really see any particular structures here. It kind of looks like a green haze that has some sort of shapes in it, but those are just the general shapes of the tissue. There aren't any labeled cells really, aside from like a few dots that might be cells. So not much is really happening here. So it begs the question, how do we amplify the signal above the noise? And I'll show you two ways that this is done in the field. Now remember, we had our goat antibody in blue. And what we can do is, in order to amplify the signal, we can have multiple antibodies find, hunt down, and tag the initial primary GOAT antibody. So basically, the thing that sticks directly to our dopamine receptor target would be a primary antibody, made again in GOAT in this example. And we would take a bunch of GOAT antibodies and have them be targeted by some other animal. So let's say we have goat antibodies, just general goat antibodies. We isolate them from goat blood. They don't have to be specifically dopamine receptor targeting. They can be just general goat antibodies. So we get a bunch of them, purify them. So it's just the goat antibodies. We then put them into an inoculation and we inject that into a different animal. So something like a donkey perhaps. And even though you might think, well, goats and donkeys seem like they're pretty similar, it turns out that the donkey's immune system will see these goat antibodies and say, oh, those, those are not mine. Those don't belong here. So they will produce antibodies against the goat antibodies. That's why we call them secondary antibodies. So a funny way of saying this specific scenario is that we have donkey anti-goat antibodies. Okay. So kind of visualizing this, um, again, we just kind of have 
the donkey being inoculated, it produces its own antibodies, and then we get a new secondary antibody. And this can be labeled as well. So it can be labeled with fluorescent stuff or other things. So we have our scenario again, we have our tissue, we have our neurons, the neurons have dopamine receptors that we can't see to the naked eye, so we need to tag them somehow. We toss in our primary antibody made from goat that targets dopamine receptors. That's all well and good. Then in a follow-up solution, we then have donkey antibodies that specifically target the goat antibodies. And you'll notice that in this case, the donkey antibodies are multiple binding to one singular goat antibody. And so this ends up amplifying the signal. And even if the goat antibody does get stuck and lost somewhere else, donkey antibodies will generally try to find the target better than just if the primary antibody were labeled itself. So this does amp up the signal a decent degree. Now, there is another level to this that we could play around with. We could just stop at, oh yeah, we have the label on the secondary antibody and we're good to go. But we could do a sort of three-step situation. And that's as follows. We have our antigen, AKA our antibody target, which in this case is a dopamine receptor. We have a primary antibody against our antigen. We have a secondary antibody against our primary antibody. But it so happens that the secondary antibody has attached to it already maybe an enzyme, such as this thing called horseradish peroxidase. And enzymes can be harnessed in order to create reactions. So in this case, the reaction is taking this chemical called AEC for short, uh, that is relatively invisible by itself, floating around a solution, doesn't really stick to anything. What'll happen is that this enzyme will start converting this into an active sticky form. In this case, it says red, pink precipitate. And so what that means is that this colorless chemical now becomes colored and sticky and will stick to all the surrounding area where the antigen is. So that'll include just the antibodies stuck to the antigen and perhaps the antigen itself. And so this reaction isn't just a one and done thing. The reaction will continue as long as there is substrate, the A AEC stuff, uh, and as long as the enzyme is still allowing for it to uh, work. So the longer we react it, the more and more the stuff gets deposited. And so we might end up getting something when we look at a brain tissue section uh, that looks something like this. So this is a, a zoom in with like a magnifying lens on top of a light box of a section of the brain that is going through the, the midbrain. So we have periaqueductal gray, uh, substantia nigra and other things sort of going on in the cortex like the hippocampus. And even though this is a little bit of a blurry picture, we can see some features of the tissue that are distinguished by the uh, different colors and lines here. In this case, rather than standing for dopamine receptors, in this tissue, I was standing for another protein called CFOS. CFOS is called an immediate early gene and although I don't need to get into the specifics of it here, it is used as a transcription factor. It is basically a protein that turns on the use of certain genes. So in neurons that are highly active, let's say, they'll start producing some of this protein because the neurons after being really active will kind of, will anthropomorphize this a little bit. We'll say that the neurons realize, oh, all this activity must mean something. I should change how I'm configured to maybe be more sensitive, to maybe rewire myself so I'm prepared for the next heavy activity period. And so the neurons will produce some of the CFOS. The CFOS will change um, how the neuron is operating. And then the neuron will then change its shape, change its activity, and so on. And so one way that we could track a lot of recent neuron activity is by staining for this CFOS protein. 
And although this looks like a general background stain, the darker areas denote neurons or locations that have had a decent amount of activity, even if it's baseline activity of that brain region. There seems to be just a lot of changes happening in these areas. And this makes sense for some place like the hippocampus, these darker lines over here, where uh, there are a lot of memory-related changes happening constantly over time. Okay. Now, again, this is sort of all talking about how we stain certain targets, and that hasn't quite gotten to the idea of what does it look like under the microscope when we actually amplify the stain this third way, where we're using an enzyme to create a reaction. Well, I like to think of this as making the stain pop out from the background, as in really amping up the signal-to-noise ratio so that the signal-to-noise is unambiguous to the human eye. And so one example of this here is we'll have our stain from before that we saw, where the background is pretty high, we can't really see much signal from the noise. There might be a few light colored dots here and there, but um, for those who don't know what they're looking at, it's basically a background green haze. So kind of leads to null results. We don't really know what we should be seeing here. Contrast this with an amplified stain, like what I've used previously, and that is shown here. And each of these bright dots is a neuron, specifically the nucleus of a neuron where CFOS would be present. Again, think transcription factors interacting with genes and DNA, a gene uh, substance is located in the cell nucleus. So cell nucleus is kind of round and dot-like. All right, so all these dots are representing neurons that have been heavily active within the last few hours. And so this really stands out compared to the other photo here, where maybe you see a few light colored dots, but really here you see a plentiful amount. And that really tells you, okay, these neurons have been active and you can start to figure out also from there what brain region is more active than another brain region based on how much staining there is. And that can lead you to a happy scientist.